I've mentioned, Westpac X dividend today down by close to 6%. Well, Queen Bell recently reached the $1 billion market cap level and entered the ASX 300 after developing here in Australia a light sensitivity drug now sold worldwide. But what next for the business and how does this biotech operate in an environment where regulatory changes are common and input costs are high? Well, let's get the outlook. I'm pleased to welcome to the desk Chief Executive of Queen Bell, Philippe Wolgan. Philippe, it's a pleasure to have you on the program with us today. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Just talk us through first up, um, talk to us a bit about what Queen Bell does, because in, in particular, you may product is for skin disorders, this photoprotective. Yes, it's, all, it's, it's a mouthful, it's a systemic That's photoprotection. I was going to try to say. I know, but I need to do it for you. So systemic photoprotection means that we inject patients in need every two months to give them protection mm. against UV and light. And that's quite unique. We're the only one in the company that uh, has attempted it and succeeded so far. And uh, when I say so far, we, we got the landmark approval in 2014 in Europe. Mm -hmm. And next is uh, the US, of course. Right, and the US is a big catalyst, I guess, um, for growth for your business. How's that tracking? And, and when you're expecting a decision, because I, I know it can be hard to put a particular date on it, but I think early F119 is where we're hearing. Well, we hope that we'll have an early um, uh, Christmas present for 2019, <laughs> but the, the steps for the FDA are to validate our package, that's the data package, and from then on, they are obliged to uh, issue a PDUFA date, and PDUFA date in the US is well known with the brokers. It means the date where the FDA is going to release white or black smoke, mm -hmm. either it's an approval or rejection. Um, in terms of how significant this could be for your business, obviously the share price has run up significantly over the last few years. I mean, sitting at $18.54 right now, how significant is this US FDA approval for your business? I mean, obviously for your stock price, but more importantly for your business and growth in your business going forward. Well, there's a long history and a legacy of this company. Uh, previous managements tried in the 90s and early 2000s. If you keep in mind that this company listed in 2001 on the ASX, um, it's really uh, our turn and the last turn to prove the industry, but certainly Australia, that we will get the FDA approval. Yeah. So it's significant for the company, but I think it's really significant for our sector here in Australia because we desperately need successes. Mm. And in terms of um, w one part of your, your business that's particularly loved by the market is the cash receipts, which has already seen um, a bit of strength, but growth in that will continue, right, if you see this US FDA approval. And, and what else are you watching for, for catalysts for these cash receipts going forward? Well, first of all, the, um, the way we operate the business is on a, on a low fixed cost base mm. and, and most variables. And uh, we differ from other pharmaceutical companies in that we vertically integrate all the functions in the company. So you need to have all the functions in the team to do it yourself rather than intermediating or having third party uh, suppliers and contractors. So by building a team worldwide that actually executes and distributes the product yourself, you reasonably can contain the cost yeah. in the company. So we are different, it's a different business model. Right, because obviously one of the key sort of downsides to a lot of the biotech and big pharma companies is the amount of money right. that's on fixed costs and yeah. high input costs in order to keep the business going. Do, where, where does sort of most of your costs go? Because is there much R&D involved, research and development costs involved in your business now that you've got this drug up and running already? Well, you can say by and large that pharmaceutical companies spend between 5 and 19% mm. of their sales back into R&D. Mm. And uh, we've never quite reached that uh, level, certainly not in, uh, in the years that were profitable. So we are going to increase it, but moderately. Um, I'm very much in favor of um, preserving your cash for economic downturns and so forth. So we want to be self-sustainable and, uh, and proficient. So this was actually the first year where we distributed part of the money back to the shareholders. Yep. Well, interesting your shareholder base, actually. I wouldn't mind talking about that because you've entered the ASX 300 now. I've just talked about how much your share price has run up, and particularly over the last you know, five years ago, significantly lower than where it was, um, where it is today. Has that changed the investor base in your business going forward? Well, I mean, it must have, right? Because mandates change as you go from a small cap as you move into the ASX 300. How has that sort of changed the base? And has that been a challenge as well? Well, the, the, in the early days, we started in uh, and actually 13 years on the day, so in November of 2005, yeah. with this corporate turnaround. And we found the equity in Europe and in the US. Mm. And so we decided to do it ourselves. We disintermediated the banks and the brokers. And we said, we are going to go on a perpetual roadshow. So we present the company when you don't need the money. Yeah. And then slowly we attracted 
uh, European and, uh, and uh, US investors. But so as you said, the moment you hit certain marks, yeah. revenues, profitability and dividends, then the Australian institutions started to mm. waken up and, uh, and, and yeah, so we have now a uh, quite a different mix on our register. Are you constantly fundraising? Is this something that you have to do as, no. a, as a pharma company or is it? Well, in the early years, absolutely. I mean, you, you are aware that we, we operate on a financial dashboard. Mm. The moment you uh, reach a critical threshold, mm. you know that you need the cash. So in order to fund your program, you need to anticipate these moments. Mm. So we were in the first six, seven years on the perpetual roadshow, although we didn't issue that much. But it's interesting because you've rejected MA activity before and you had a, what you called an opportunistic offer a couple of years ago. Um, would you take, I mean, everyone takes an offer at the right price, but I mean, in, in terms of, of interest in the business, is it something, is it something you have to fend off? Absolutely. And so in, in our business, we have critical milestones mm. or corporate catalysts, and those that take an, uh, an opportunistic view, certainly in the US, are going to throw a low ball, a low bid offer to you, and then we, we didn't accept it. And, and this particular individual was revered uh, for doing so. He's now uh, yeah, serving a seven year jail sentence in the US. So we attract these kind of opportunists in, in the company, and then you're on constant alert and defense in order to, uh, to progress your company. But the key is that you need to know early on the intrinsic value mm. of the company. And if you know the intrinsic value and you think you can execute against it, mm. you issue a premium. How does Asia play into the story, or does it play into the story? I mean, it's such a big potential market there. We know the growing, also some changes are going on in terms of Chinese FDA um, policies in, in relation to approvals. Is this a market that you're interested in? Well, you need to go to the markets where there is an addressable need. Yeah. And so it's for us, it's Europe and the US and Australia, mm -hmm. and so Asia is really the, the last of, uh, of the tier. Yeah. Mm. In terms of uh, branching out both from what you do now, because obviously you've got your big product, how much is it just based on that product and, and finding different uses for it, or do you, you know, look at developing more products yeah, once it's successful? That's an excellent question. So that, that phenomenon is called translational science, or yeah. translational technology. You start in one domain, mm. you become a world expert in it, and then slowly expand your expertise and for the use of your products. Mm. So we've got a product with multiple users, we always knew it, but you first need a regulatory approval, then you need someone who writes the check, namely a state and an insurer, and then you can fantasize about the rest. But how do you go with a, in an environment where you're dealing with, you know, so many changes in terms of regulations and FDA approvals, it's it's almost a bit of potluck involved in, in that, depending on which region you're, you're operating in or which region. I know the US and, and Europe are probably um, a little different to some of the other regions, but it, is it hard to, if, I mean, what are the challenges you see as in your business in terms of around some of these um, regulatory approvals and, um, you know, high costs of drug development, some of these issues and structural changes and government issues that, that all impact pharma in all different regions that you have to develop in? There's so many aspects to your question, yeah. and we need all afternoon. So, <laughs> first of all, we start with the, the, the biggest challenges in our industry is to get a regulatory approval. Yeah. And so, you can simplify by saying you need to tick two boxes. First of all, it needs to be safe, long run and midterm, mm. and it needs to be effective. If you think that the efficacy is the most prominent feature, you're probably wrong because the FDA is much more concerned about safety long term. Yeah. So you need to know early on in your program whether your product or me medical therapy is safe. And once you have satisfied these criteria, you can slowly expand your company. So the, the challenges are very much in getting European and FDA approval because mm. that speaks volume to the investors. And from that moment on, the next challenge is actually to find the insurers and the states in Europe, it's 28 nations, mm. to reimburse and pay for the drug. So that's, that's a function that we kept in-house. And once you start analyzing the markets, you know which countries to address first and which ones last. And once these first countries come on board, it becomes a, a much easier execution. So the, the business model was very much, are you going to do it yourself or are you going to invite third parties to do it for you or with you? And in doing so, you lose control. So if you have a unique proposition and it is 
mm. innovative or disruptive technology, mm. then you have to do it yourself. Well, it's very interesting, and it's certainly clean your come a long way. We really appreciate your time on the program and joining us, actually. Pleasure. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right, we will leave that there. In the meantime, we'll take a look at some of the top movers.